How much time do I have left? Great. Self-timing too. Uh, where is the pointer? Great. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, I just want to thank you for doing what you do. You are where the rubber meets the road. Um, and I'm about to take it, um, hopefully upset you and overwhelm you and maybe encourage you. Uh, Greg asked the question is, where do we draw the circle around when he opened the conference today? He's like, what do our plans need to encompass now? So you are working at the most potent level. And so when we go big, it might seem like, what's my role? But everybody has touched on the fact that the problem starts with individuals, where they live, where they walk, where they play. And if we don't get everybody to understand they're a watershed manager or a water manager, um, we can't win because once it leaves our hands, leaves our property, it conglomerates into something very undoable. Fortunately, there's technology that can help us think big and also empower at the micro level. So um, I'm going to do a 75 minute presentation in hopefully 12. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, welcome to the new norm. As the governor describes, we are, oh, <clears throat> the head of the uh, California Natural Resources Agency opened a conference here uh, a couple months ago and said, ladies and gentlemen, the infrastructure that we've built, and this reflects just what, um, what Greg said, the infrastructure that we've built to enable our culture, our society to function, e the economy to function, and to protect public health and safety, that brilliant infrastructure was built for a different climate than we have today. And that infrastructure can no longer protect public health, health and safety. It can no longer guarantee our economy. You said it's sunsetting. That's for sure. Whether you want to call it climate change or not, the game is changing and it's changing fast. You really are at the front lines. You really are the first responders. Um, but you haven't been asked to do that. And today I'm inviting you. So new norm. This is a typical. Um, what used to be fall in Los Angeles, now it's any time. Um, <clears throat> two weeks after John Laird said that about infrastructure, we had Houston, we then had Florida. We had, for the first time ever, four concurrent hurricanes in the Gulf at one time. A couple more weeks, we had Santa Rosa and an urban wildfire like never seen before, over 10,000 homes uh, burnt. What does that have to do with watershed? Well, everything. Um, so that's part of it. But the new norm in the climate extremes is wetter wets, drier dries, colder colds, windier winds, and um, it, it's changing the game. But the watershed really is one of the key elements, either uh, the base of infrastructure, the engineering design from which we should biomimic. Um, this happens to be Three people volunteers in flood in 1978, another one in 1980. When we got hit back to back 100 year floods, people called for help, called the fire department. There wasn't 911 yet. And everyone, thousands of people whose homes were getting inundated with mud flows, were told, sorry, we got nothing for you. The first part of the infrastructure of protecting public health and safety and water and everything else is community. Right now, today, until this new infrastructure is built, you are most likely to be saved by your neighbor, if, or you're most likely to save your neighbor, if you're aware, if you're trained, if you're communicating, if you know it's part of your job. And whether it's a flood or whether it's microplastics, it's the same thing. We all have power in it. Um, so <clears throat> I have to give a word to my sponsor. I'm from Tree People. Um, and I have time to tell you about us. But uh, you talked about oaks in your presentation. This is um, really where the watershed starts. I'm showing you this because former chief of the US Forest Service, Mike Dombeck, tried to shift the Forest Service back to being watershed based. And he nearly got fired by Congress. And they definitely went after destroying the Forest Service because of it. And I said to him, why? Why did you take that risk? He said, because that's it. Um, 
he was a forest ranger in Petaluma when there were a couple floods. And he asked an old farmer, what happened? Was it always like this? And the farmer said, no. So he said, what happened? And he said, the farmer said, they took away all the sponges. That's them. Oh, man, I just sacrificed five minutes. Uh, so engineering design of that one tree, 100 feet in diameter. Um, here's over that hundreds of years, it's a little dark. Um, it's dropping leaves, it's building soil, it's created habitat for all these critters that work together collaboratively in this space uh, and in this space to capture water, um, first in the canopy, um, and release it, not just down the trunk, but release it to the soil, release it to the ground. Groundwater flowing across is captured in that space. And those critters, uh, they, what are they doing? They wind up cleaning the water. Those same critters, the micro critters, are the same ones we take out and put into sewage treatment plants to clean our poop. It's not the machines, it's life that does that. They take that water and send it to the aquifer. To save one oak in Los Angeles that was threatened with development, I asked the US Forest Service Research Lab to calculate the liquid storage volume of that space under the tree. Anybody got a guess with a tree that's 100 feet in diameter? So five feet deep, 100 foot circle, filled with rocks, roots, and everything else. It captures and holds in a flash flood of 10 to 12 inches, 120,000 gallons, one tree and recharges that. Our challenge today is what happens when you remove that tree? What do we replace the services with? That was doing flood control, water supply, water quality, groundwater recharge, habitat, atmospheric recharge. Oh, I left off that. Yeah, I'm just skipped through that. Uh, recharging the clouds, the short water cycle, and cooling. So what we replace it with is bureaucracy. Seriously all these agencies, and they didn't replace all the services, but water supply, flood control, stormwater pollution, economic development, sanitation, and they're regulated, they're in their silos, they have a job to do, they've got labor to deal with, they've got regulations, they've got now illiteracy, and they, none of them have enough funding to do their job. And they're now competing and conflicting, and they're building infrastructure that competes and conflicts. That's what we have today. The whole point of multi-purpose and collaboration and thinking like an ecosystem is to do this, is when we bring our agencies together, we start finding and we think like a watershed and understand the living system. We see where they overlap all the kinds of benefits that we have instead of a single purpose solution that just isn't responsible for all the problems that they generate by going single purpose. And right at the core when we do that is equity. The opportunity to redirect the funds that we're going to be using, which is trillions of dollars in this state alone, to rebuild this infrastructure, and it's going to be spent. But in the single purpose siloed, there's not enough. We don't see a resource. We see people fighting. We have to make this happen, and agencies aren't able to do it without everyone's support because they're regulated. Um, so that's the model by which we need to be thinking, and that's what's been driving the tree people vision for a long time. We saw that, I've been preaching this now for over 20 years, we had to prove that it was technically, engineering-wise, socially, people would accept this and participate, and most importantly, financially feasible. The three-legged stool is if you bring them together, what you have is a case for a co-investment and a hybrid infrastructure that does it all and can be co-managed with people and the agencies. That sounds, that's a mouthful. You've seen some of this, but the way, how we were able to do some of these first LID projects uh, ever implemented was to bring the agencies together to try working together. So taking a, a normal parkway, turning it into um, bioswales where uh, treatment wetlands where the water is being captured from the street, filtered, and then sent down to underground infiltration system. Biomimicking the, um, what the tree does. Here is um, a cistern at Tree People headquarters that's the same footprint as that oak. It's 100 feet in diameter. Instead of five feet deep, it's 10 feet deep. Instead of rocks, it's got pillars. It's, uh, it has uh, the ability to store 218,000 gallons of rainwater. Um, this is 
during a red flag alert when it was 105 degrees in Los Angeles during the drought, 2014. In January, our cistern was empty. In February, it, February, it rained four inches. That was it for the year. But we captured 87,000 gallons from that four inches from our rooftops and our parking lot, treated it, it's sitting there. That truck's job is to fill helicopters. We had enough water to fill 250 initial attack helicopters should the LA water system fail, which it does in a major fire. This fire truck came to us, red lights and siren. I ran out and said, what's up? And they said, we heard you had water. And I said, we do come and get it. And they called engine companies and pumped and were ready. They didn't need it that time. But that's resilience, that's sustainability, that's our watershed. But nobody in the system's thinking it. The fire department has known about this for, for 15 years since we built it, and we keep telling them, and they keep forgetting. What do we do at a larger scale? Retrofitting all land in the, uh, in the urban watershed. This is a park that was receiving fl polluted flood water. Um, we were able to create, with LA County Public Works, flood control, LA Department of Water and Power, LA City Sanitation, and the Parks Department all collaborating investing $5 million to fix this and recharge. Um, the flood, it's a 45-acre watershed that feeds to that park and then adds more flood water afterwards. Um, the park was dug up. It looks like a parking lot. Two million gallons of storage underneath. It goes through a treatment plant first. This is how it works. That's the 45 acres where the water, it's picking up contaminants through the city streets, just as Tim talked about, goes through a multi-phase treatment plant and recharges the aquifer. It's so potent that you see to the left that gray area, the city and the county, because this has been so effective at recharging the aquifer and eliminating uh, pollution and flooding, they spent $30 million to purchase this landfill, inert landfill on uh, the side, and it's now going to be a beautiful treatment wetland park. Um, and I got more to go. So. We were doing bits and pieces really well, but still moving it to the full on system scale where collaboration becomes the new norm and mandate. That's our challenge. In case I forget at the end, we are now in a state of chronic emergency, right? All these climate threats and other breakdowns. We don't recognize it unless you step back. We know, this community knows the best practice for emergency management is to bring people together in an integrated command center where they're sharing, collaborating, adaptively managing. But we can't just do it in a single event by event emergency command center. Think full-time ecosystem watershed. So this is what we've been doing at, with Los Angeles, getting these agencies to work together like they never have before. The head of sanitation, the head of flood control, the head of... Department of Water and Power had never met together, ever. Two of them had, but the three had never met. We brought the three of them together, each brought 20 of their scientists and engineers to get with them, and we had a one-day charrette with the intent of designing a hybrid system that handled all their needs. And we're all brilliant. We just need to be able to work together and do this, right? So we took three separate systems, and the goal was, can we build the new infrastructure that is efficient um, and does it all? And the answer was absolutely yes. Not only is it gray and green and living, it's smart. So those little orange things are remote control, cloud control, additions to what gets built. So what we did was take the stuff you know, put it on a house. This is essentially LID, uh, adding a cistern, rain gardens, um, and a smart cistern, uh, so it fills with water. When you see in the forecast that it's going to rain, the cistern is drained um, partially to recharge the aquifer if you've got access to the aquifer or sent uh, to the treatment plant for recycling uh, through the landscape first. Uh, and then, but this is what it looks like. So we got the agencies to invest a million dollars together to build six pilots in South LA in the San Fernando Valley testing different soil types. Each home of the six got at least a 1,000 gallon cistern, some were as big as uh, 4,000 gallons. This is remote, censored, and monitored. Every homeowner has the app on their phone. They can control where their water goes from their phone, but the agencies see it as well. 
the cisterns connected to uh, <clears throat> treatment, wetland, bioswale, and uh, rain garden if we have access to the aquifer. Um, from the single parcel scale where really most of the power is and agencies never want to go there, people are loving it and they want to do it. Um, but we can go to the street scale, to the regional scale, like under parks and schools where we've been building stuff, and it all can connect up um, and be managed cooperatively by the multiple agencies. And I took those graphics out because I didn't have time. But each agency sees the whole network of cisterns together, how much water is in them, and they can cooperatively manage when they're talking that water. Is it going to be used for, for first flush of the storm drain system? Is it going to be sent to the recycling plant? They have the ability to do all that and not lose it now. Um, this was the media show, actually, where we cut the ribbon. This is the mayor and the agency heads and um, county supervisor and the homeowner. And that iPad that Mayor Garcetti's holding was actually you know, what you ha all, the homeowner also has on their phone. Interestingly, we had more than 50 news agencies show up for this press conference during the drought. It was as filled as a White House press conference not merely local because of what we were doing. So you talked about that. So this, these are some images of what the, the yards, oh, there's the collective monitor. It's online, we can get you the link, you can be monitoring the amount of water that's being collected and managed. The key is this scales, and this is just the last point. We didn't just build the six. We said, what would it take to take it all the way to scale in the county? So LA County has one and a half million single family homes. We used, for the first time ever, a LIDAR-based modeling tool, and we were able to look at the watershed of every single home and calculate the space for all the LID components. Turns out we eliminated uh, the ones that didn't have space by space or by code. It left us with 1.2 million homes that had space for smart cisterns and rain gardens, bioswales. Um, so what happens if we went to full implementation with, on average, a 1,000-gallon cistern and capture system per home? And by the way, it doesn't have to be cistern. It could be whatever your, your appropriate BMPs are. So the, the turns out that the countywide impervious surface, the rooftops of those 1.2 million homes represented 17% of the impervious surfaces of the entire county. That's a lot. No one knew that before. The LIDAR calced it for us. In terms of pollutant loading, um, you know, we designed each LID landscape to capture and treat pollutants on site, not release them. If we did this, it would pull 15% of the pollutant loading out of the, the countywide system, just keeping it on private land, uh, using zinc as the indicator. Really incredible is that it produces... 350 million user days of emergency water online. We have no emergency water for the 10 million people living in Los Angeles. With a quake, neighborhoods that don't have enough water for firefighting and people don't know it. So that's enough um, water to sustain Los Angeles County's 10 million people with uh, United Nations declared levels of emergency water on hand, just if we did this piece. And when we add on the rest of the landscape, it gets really, really potent. So let's bring it home to what do we need to do, the skill sets that we need. How does the emergency command center work? We learn a common language, good facilitation, good partnership, good vision, training, and an interlocking net of mutual aid agreements that allow us as our agencies to actually co-invest with each other. Um, when we tell this story, we'll get the voters with us. You know, I wanna just close with something Steve said, or Tim said, or you both said, reminded me when Los Angeles County's begun to look at getting funding online to deal with stormwater and public illiteracy is so strong, so big and such a barrier uh, that two of the five county supervisors bust in protesters against their own initiative to try to kill it. And it was going pretty well, and one person from the public got up and said, congratulations, God gave us the rain. 
and you figured out how to tax it. The county supervisor, who was for the measure, said touche. It was over. The hearing was over. The measure was over. It was done. No movement. We're trying to bring it back. I had already spoken, and I couldn't get to the podium fast enough without getting shot, because um, it's a secure institution, to say, you're right, sir. God did give us the rain. We figured out how to pollute it, to poison it, to hurt people with it, to kill sea life with it. Damn straight, we need to pay to clean it up. But that's the message we've got to get. Not just that we got to pay, but that it's all our jobs and it's all within our reach. So thank you for doing what you do. You're heroes. We can do this. Thank you, Andy. And we have about 10 minutes or a little less for questions. And we do have some mics. So we'd like to take some questions for the panelists from the audience. Hi, this is just a question for Andy. Um, I saw in the graphics that you talked about the treatment built into um, the park in LA that was capturing stormwater. And I just wondered what kind of treatment that was and what type of maintenance you kind of go through with that. Um, I really want to underscore maintenance with everything because that's really the key. Um, and we don't we haven't been planning the humans in, into the infrastructure, and that's where equity comes in, by the way. It's like, you know, Los Angeles imports 90% of its water, and 30% of it comes from here, Sacramento River. I learned a couple years ago that we are drinking recycled water. LA, everyone in LA believes that they're drinking pristine water. It was when a, a speaker from here opened the conference with saying, you know, we have this saying, Sacramento, flush hard. It's a long way to Los Angeles. <laughs> I went, are you kidding me? <laughs> and yes, the intake to the aqueduct is less than a half mile from the outflow from your treatment plant, straight to LA through the Central Valley. Um, pumping that third of water into Los Angeles is, takes, is the largest single use of electricity in the state of California. So instead of human energy, we're paying for carbon-based fuel, the single largest use of electricity in the sixth largest economy in the world, to pump one-third of LA's water to LA, so it can then use 40 to 70% of the water we use to inappropriately water our landscapes. And our dry weather flow in Los Angeles is about 100 million gallons a day of irrigation overspray, right? So it's waste, waste, waste. It seems like futile. Why I just told you that story and the amount of money to pay for that fuel to pump the water in could instead be paying for human energy and natural capital in our communities, maintaining all this green infrastructure. That's the key. And that I showed you the bioswale and that was Elmer Avenue. We did that as a cooperative research project with the Watershed Council who wanted to test the viability of building LID BMPs without maintenance money, thinking the community will do it. We've never said that. I mean, our, we think there's jobs, necessary jobs. We have all these humans and we have Silicon Valley saying, how are we going to pay people to live so they can just consume? <laughs> you can't warehouse human energy or anything else. So maintenance is absolutely key to anything we build, and we're going to have to educate for that and fight for it so we don't have labor-saving technology instead of humans. In terms of the specific um, treatment stuff, I'm not the scientist, but so first there's a, the typical trash removal and screening, but then there's two other stages of removing hydrocarbons and other, other toxins. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. The, the system is monitored and alarmed and extremely well maintained. If any pollutant enters the system that it's, the system's not prepared to, uh, to treat in its normal way, it, it shuts it down so it doesn't get into the water supply. Um, and there's a day's worth of conversation about how we brought the regulator, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, in as a partner instead of just an enforcer. So we built everything with them at the design table 
they had veto over, over anything we did. So uh, the Sun Valley watershed that that was a key piece of was going to just be simply a $50 million storm drain to remove flood water from that community. By one of the first ever urban watershed projects was to look instead of a storm drain, we created this watershed. The approved budget, it's a much longer story, but I'll tell you this piece now. You saw our cost benefit modeling tool that helps us assemble multiple agencies together to see the benefits and where their dog is in the fight and how much it is that they can legitimately invest. The result of creating that tool and using it for this watershed project was we came out with a $200 million budget instead of a 50 million, not because we were failing. It was approved because the model showed it was generating a $300 million payback in savings and cash and benefits, including $180 million worth of water back in the LA's aquifer. And that was the approved budget, and that's what we're, we're using. So, and that includes the jobs. I hope in all that I answered your question. So we've, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions very quickly. Got one over here. Hi, I think, uh, Andy, you're probably going to have the answer to this question. Uh, I'm Bill Templin, and, and my question is, uh, I've noticed in the Sacramento area, the water suppliers all have to flush out their water supply lines regularly uh, for chemical and sand and other things. Fire, uh, fire hydrants have to be flushed, too. Are you guys capturing that? Is that being used in your cistern network? I, I've been recommending that, but I haven't received a lot of support for that idea up here. Well, the sister network we, sh we showed right now is rainwater, which, by the way, represents half the water Los Angeles needs, and it's all thrown away right now. Right? Um, and so I don't know the answer to your question, and maybe, maybe someone else does here, about this at the system level when stuff is being flushed. LA has captured a dry, has begun building its dry weather flow capture and diversion system to the treatment plant. So there are portions of LA that are now online where it is picking up dry weather flow. So I'm assuming that that's where that water is going to be picked up. Um, but it's not yet throughout the system. Um, I used to work for a, a mid-sized water district as a consultant and uh, they were part of our discussion in 2014 for the NPDES permit we, we issued here at the state level for the whole state for potable water discharges for, uh, that are associated with pipeline cleaning and that sort of thing. Um, bottom line, uh, it goes to the gutter. And so, uh, and, and really folks hadn't been thinking, hey, this is something we need to, to because it was incremental, you know, it was 0.1% kind of level. But uh, if you design your drainage system to do all those good things to clean, you know, to mimic watershed processes, then it, it actually just sort of incrementally benefits the aquifer, better water quality, et cetera. Right now they have to dechlorinate um, to make sure they don't kill fish uh, because the gutters are plumped straight to the creeks. Um, the more we disconnect the gutters from the creeks, uh, slow down the gutters, you know, over 50 years, you know, uh, then that, those type of discharges can be part of the benefit, uh, the better managed water cycle. And I think we have time for one more question. Boy, you're like my students. Quiet. Could you state your name, please? Uh, I'm John Johnston from Sac State. Um, it makes sense in Los Angeles where they're desperate for every drop, and water is expensive for all these agencies to have a, a uh, incentive to collaborate. But how about other parts of the state? How do we convince people around here where water is a lot cheaper and a lot more plentiful that they that there's advantages to this. Well, remember Folsom Reservoir was about to run out and people weren't that comfortable around here. Uh, and also, if you look at a map of uh, by hydrologic region of the state, and I have a map I like to remind people that the Bay Area is imports as much water percentage-wise as LA, as Los Angeles, as San Diego. Right now, Orange County doesn't uh, because they beneficially reuse wastewater uh, and, and other and, and brine, briny groundwater, and so they're only 30 percent reliant on imported water, whereas LA is 90 percent. That's pretty wild to think about. San Francisco Bay Area, 
66% relying on imported water, right? So nobody should be comfortable. And then so Sacramento, it has a lot to do with demand management. You know, the per capita use before the drought here in the in Sacramento area was obscene, in my opinion. Um, but it really came down dramatically when people start paying attention. It's it's all good. You know, it was it was an it was a, a resource of, of plenty. It was cheap. Uh, why you know why be all overwrought about it? But if we re if we um, kind of turn ourselves around and think, oh yeah, water is precious. It's vital to us. It makes communities possible. It's what we have in common. Then we start treating it w with more respect, a better relationship with water. It doesn't matter if you're in Placer County where water is plentiful relative to the population, or if you're in Los Angeles where you import 90%. Uh, it really will turn things around in terms of our per capita use and create this resiliency that will have exponential benefits. So I, you know, we have to keep talking about it. And, just, and, and maybe some of those terms I use, but also just practically um, Folsom Reservoir was 30 days away from, from uh, drying below the, the intake line and it was going to get real expensive for Roseville and for Sacramento. So. We'll just have to keep reminding folks that it's, uh, with climate change, uh, it's not a given, and we have to be um, responsible stewards. Okay, with that, I'd uh, like to close out our plenary session, thank our speakers. I think that they've given us uh, quite a few things to think about today, and um, we really appreciate it. Um, we are taking a quick break. There's still coffee. Um, the other room that we have, the Klamath room, as long as the internet is working, uh, the broadcast is also going into that room if we need it for overflow. And if our speakers for the next session could stick around so we can get you ready to go. So thank you very much.
going to get started in just a minute. If you could uh, start to take your seats and the speakers come up for the next session, please. That would be Dahlia, Barbara, Matt, and Mike. Yeah, we're trying to get, we're, we're get her session is, we're, we're going, this next session is going, so if we can get you up here, yeah. All right, and do you still have um, Taylor Bryant's slides? Yes. Okay, if we can uh, take our seats, please. Okay, if we can take our seats, we'll uh, get our networking done at lunchtime. Okay. You can see your presentation. Okay. So we can.